and uh, we can start to admit them, I think. Super. Welcome, if you've just joined us, we'll wait, oh, there's Rob. Um, we'll wait just a, a minute before we get started. Warm welcome, uh, we'll start in just a minute. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're one minute um, past the top of the hour. Um, so we'll go ahead and switch from this beautiful screenshot, which says what we're doing today, ethical leaders, better democracies. Um, and a, a warm welcome. I'm Lisa Witter from A Political Foundation. Really excited to be co-hosting this um, with TAI and um, our, our friends at Chandler. Um, let's make this human. So if you can, put yourself in gallery view and go ahead in the chat, say your name, organization and where in the world you are get a sense of this global reach i know that we've got people on from peru let's see i'm just wondering uh germany us india thanks sonia for getting us oh yeah we have first here agosto from lima sonia from austria keep it going oh there's reed nice to see you reed And Ni, nee, hello, Ni. Nee. Did I pronounce it correctly? Give me a thumbs up. There you go. And if I mispronounce your name, I'm really um, sorry. Oh, goodness, Maria, you have everyone being very jealous, calling in from Crete. Thank you, Maura. Rob, so good to have you on. Um, I'm going to call on you in a bit to talk about imagination. Are you open for that? All game. Super. Nice to meet you. Hello. Um, who else did we just have? Keep putting your name and your organization and where the world you're from. We'll get a sense of who's in the room. Hello, Clara. In Seattle, my hometown. Always good to have you on. She helped organize this. Hello, Deepa and Debbie and Jane and my friend Winfred. Wave at Winfred. Um, Ashifa from Open Government. George from Athens. My colleague Janani. Emily, hello, Chloe. Hello, hello. There we go. A Peruvian, but MPP in, in Berlin, fantastic. Hello, Inez. I just saw Tony Pippa join. Tony, that's that's a, I haven't talked to you in a while. Wonderful to have you on from the Brookings Institute. He's an amazing scholar. If you don't read his work on SDGs and just in general, just fantastic work. Really, really powerful work. Okay, we're going to um, go ahead and roll that video, Mel, um, welcoming everyone to Catalyzing Change Week. Really exciting. Welcome to Catalyzing Change Week. This year's Catalyzing Change Week is about solutions from the front lines by social innovators. In 2022, Catalyst 2030 concentrated its efforts on bringing proximate leaders and frontline solutions to the forefront. Collaborations led by members from the Global South produced groundbreaking reports on climate and transforming education, with an emphasis on offering local solutions. We continued our mission to create an enabling environment for social entrepreneurs to flourish by initiating a letter to donors signed by more than 1,200 social entrepreneurs and innovators. The Catalyst 2030 award ceremony was spectacular and the awards themselves welcomed by the private sector, governments, buyer multilaterals and donors. Catalyst 2030 as a movement is disruptive. One of the best things I think that's come out of Catalyst 2030 so far um, is incredible collaboration across the ecosystem that just didn't exist before Catalyst came into being. The thing I love most about Catalyst is that it's an open movement for social entrepreneurs around the world. I would encourage anyone who's 
uh, looking to be more connected with their local communities around social development goals to come along to Catalyzing Change Week. Welcome to Catalyzing Change Week. Lovely. So welcome everyone again. If you haven't, do introduce yourself in the chat and maybe we'll just before we start, let's wave because we're real people doing real things around the world. We care about people on the planet. That's why we're here. Again, I'm Lisa Witter, the co-founder of Apolitical and the CEO of the Apolitical Foundation. And the blurb that you may have seen, um, Better Leaders, Better Democracies, um, is really a call to look for the role of leadership around the great work that um, all of us are doing and at, um, and at Catalyst. And we really think collectively that while it's critically important to have institutions doing this work, we also need to have um, political leaders doing this work and the role of leadership. And so some of the questions we asked is, you know, um, what, what would be different if we had the politicians that we thought were trustworthy and service-minded? So we will be hearing from solutions from the front line, from some political leadership entrepreneurs, one from India, one from Austria, and one from Peru doing that. But before um, we get into a little background, um, I'm going to ask you all to put, um, we're going to do very interactive, um, I'm going to give you a prompt, and you're going to put a word or two, the first thing that comes to mind when I mention it. Welcome, Blair. Um, great to be here and thanks for everything you do in this space a real hero um, on governance so wonderful to have you okay prompt number one in a word or two what issues or sdg do you work on this should be easy <laughs> you shouldn't have to think about it too much it's probably your day-to-day -day life but in a word or two what issues education says debbie all of them governance 16 and equality human dignity all of them Great, transport, partnerships. Um, hi, Molly, great to see you here. Wonderful to have you. Um, super, in a word or two, all of them, all of them, gender equality, education and governance, complex systems. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Molly, this fantastic work on education and governance. Education and new governance, yes. Um, welcome, Daniel, really good to have you here. He's, I read his work a lot, so be watching how he's thinking about democracy. Localization, partnership, education, uh, fantastic. Okay, second prompt. Um, in one word, um, why is good governance important to the issue you work on? Now, this may be very obvious to you, or maybe you skip over it in your mind, but let's put it in the chat. On those issues you just listed, why is good governance important? Yeah, democratic survival, says Augusto. Definitely true. Anyone watches the news in Peru, it's been quite tense. Strengthening democracy, cultural integrity, trust, accountability. Yeah, it deals with the causes rather than the symptoms, future skills, trust, collective action. Thanks, Ni, nee, Winfred, Rob. It's fundamental to addressing um, any community challenges, Reed. Yeah, necessary for solving complex issues. Thanks, Tony. Great, thanks for everyone for being so interactive. Um, the next one and the last one uh, to kick us off and then our speaker is gonna come back to some of your words. So please feel free to put in the chat. We're gonna be watching the whole time. In a word, what would you want to be different about political leadership today to advance your issues? What would you want to be different about political leadership today to advance those issues? Integrity. Now, Blair, please put a link to the work that you uh, do on integrity. Molly says more young people in office. Yeah, she, she works definitely on this day in and day out with great people. Everyone should matter. Distributed, um, broader and more representative politics, distributed politics, representative democracies, courageous, compassion, be willing to work together, ethical, less cynical, um, yeah, humble, good ancestors. Um, oh, <laughs> there's some politics happening there with, with Deepa. That's, that's, her, that's real for her. That's what she wants. Young leadership taking important roles, definitely. Okay, so I'm gonna thank you everyone for that and keep the chat going because this isn't for us, the people who organized it, it's for all of us, it's for you, all of us. So please, let's continue to make this interactive. Um, we hear accountability for culture. Perfect. Okay, now I want to introduce a little bit of framing to the topic um, from our colleagues who co 
organize this session. First, I'm going to ask Maura um, from, from Chandler to go ahead and give a little framing about why this is important to you all. Thanks, Maura. Sure thing. And oh, am I, can you hear me okay? Yeah, perfectly. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you, Lisa, and happy May Day to you all. My name is Maura Donlin, and I'm the Director of Advocacy of the Chandler Foundation. We are honored to join with a political foundation and the Transparency and Accountability Initiative to co-host today's session, Ethical Leaders, Better Democracies, Good Governance for People and Planet. We'd also like to thank Catalyst 2030, for creating the robust civil society platform that is Catalyzing Change Week. While our conversation today will primarily focus on SDG 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions, I urge you to explore all of the 200 plus sessions that will be taking place between now and Friday that will touch on every one of the 17 SDGs. And given the many challenges our world faces, the unique forum that is Catalyst 2030 and Catalyzing Change Week give me real hope. SDG 16 is dedicated to the promotion of peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, the provision of access to justice for all and building effective, accountable institutions at all levels. As you all know, SDG 16 is both an output and the most fundamental enabler of every other SDG. Without brave ethical leaders and transparent and accountability, accountable institutions, there really is no way to deliver on, on anything. Poverty, hunger, health, education, gender justice, clean water, fighting climate change, or saving our planet's precious biodiversity. Just name your SDG. And what's more, in the absence of these, we know it is the most vulnerable and marginalized in society who suffer the most. At the Chandler Foundation, we work to build cultures of integrity and advance social mobility. To do this, we lead hard into supporting ethical leadership. We are a proud member of the Transparency and Accountability Initiative and an enthusiastic supporter of the work of the Apolitical Foundation, particularly its work supporting political leadership incubators. We full-throatedly encourage other funders to embrace what are the very bedrocks of SDG 16, participation, openness, accountability, anti-corruption, human rights, and ethical poli political leadership. Some funders may shy away from these areas, perceiving them to be partisan or too political. And yet, as you will hear today, there are scores of social entrepreneurs who are working to support ethical leadership in nonpartisan ways. Being nonpartisan does not mean you leave your values behind. You can be nonpartisan, but still driven by the values of anti-corruption, transparency, openness, justice, and inclusion, all the ingredients we need to reach SDG 16. So with that, I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining and I'm really looking to the, forward to the conversation. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much, Maura. I um, really appreciate that. And welcome uh, to anyone who's just joined us. Please do introduce yourself. Michael, over to you with TAI. Thanks, Lisa. And it's lovely to be with everybody today. Um, it's always a pleasure to co-host with Apolitical and, and with Chandler. Um, so I had the, the Secretariat of, of TAI, Transparency and Accountability Initiative. And as Maura hinted, we're a, a donor collaborative. We have uh, a mix of private and public funders, Chandler Foundation, obviously, but also Ford, Hewlett, MacArthur, Luminate, OSF and Skoll Foundations, and then two affiliate members, the UK Development Agency and USAID. Um, and all our members care about this issue of good governance, as Maura just eloquently outlined. Um, we believe in people having the ability to be fully informed and empowered. We believe in governments that are held um, to be accountable. Um, and we believe in fostering collective action that can pursue the public good. And as more outlined, this good governance agenda is really the, the sort of enabler of making progress on the full range of SDGs and development writ large. Um, and I would argue to some extent about this whole saving democracy agenda, um, which has become increasingly, um, simply increasingly important over the coming, over the recent years. Um, 
And when I look at the landscape of the fund funding in this space, there's sort of two tracks. I'd say there's one track that's more the bilateral and multilateral that is concentrated on support to governments and building their capacity and rule of law, strengthening civil service. And a quick shout out to, again to Blair and the team at Accountability Lab for what they do in celebrating civil servants who act with integrity. If you haven't checked that out, please do. Um, so that's track one. And then there's a second track, which is support which largely comes from the philanthropic side, which is going to civil society to help assure there's accountability. So they're playing watchdog roles. It's the brave work of investigative uh, journalists. There's a lot of policy advocacy and really being in the weeds of what tweaks and, and loopholes can be closed that will make government function more effectively, ensure that we're really delivering on what's needed. What I fear is lost in the middle is this support to the leaders who are going to be championing that change and overseeing it within government. And um, as Maura said, perhaps there's a reticence to be too political, um, but this doesn't need to be a partisan piece. So if we're investing in the next generation of leaders and leaders who, who will act with integrity, then we're going to have a far higher chance of delivering on all these other bigger pieces that we need. And there's a great article today by Stephen Bush in the Financial Times, if you have the chance to check it out, that talks about how unique operating in the political space is. And it's, it's the spark for it is the situation in the UK where there've been a number of cases of bullying by politicians. And it's saying, well, politicians are rewarded by winning elections and then they're thrown into running government departments, which they're often not well trained uh, to do. And it's just one more element of sort of this need to invest in the next generation of political leadership. And I know we're gonna hear some really inspiring stories um, that give us hope that that is already happening in certain places um, and that will give us a sense of what more could be achieved. So with that note, um, delighted to be part of these conversations. If you ever want to talk more about the world of good governance, uh, I'm here. I'd love to have that conversation. I'm going to hand it back to you, Lisa. Thank you, Michael. Um, and it goes right back. Always good to be with you, Maura, and the teams uh, working together on this. I'm going to bridge from the middle that you talked about. I've heard you talk about it as a sandwich. And in the middle is the, these leaders actually doing the work of accountability and trans, transparency and good governance and institutional um, work that is important. And I'm going to talk about that leadership. And last year um, at the Apolitical Foundation, we did a report looking at that. Um, better leaders, um, better democracies. I'll, I'll put a um, link in there. But just to step back a little bit so you know about me. So I um, am the co-founder of a, a company called Apolitical, which works um, on the bureaucratic side of the democracy flywheel where citizens give power to the politicians, the politicians then give the mandate to the civil servants and alongside the citizens deliver on democracy. And so the company is a peer-to-peer -peer learning platform for bureaucrats um, for the 21st century. And the work we do at the foundation is to help cultivate new and different people to go into politics and, and support good ones um, in there already. Um, and we do it in a, a nonpartisan way. And this report, Better Leaders, Better Democracies, we wanted to look at who's, who's actually training the future leaders and who's sort of providing um, what leaders need for the 21st century. And we put this map together um, and we noticed that um, there's very little resources going to this, as Michael talked about, yet there's massive amounts of growing um, social entrepreneurship from the ground up. Um, younger people, people are in their communities saying, we need to make this better. They come from either democracy spaces or climate spaces or gender equity spaces or any of the SDGs that you listed and said, God, we're bumping up against change if we don't have better governance and, and we don't have um, political leaders who respect that governance. And so that's what we did. We mapped them um, and talked about how we could work together um, to do that. And this year we put out a list um, yes, thank you. We, we had a great article, thanks to the Chandler Foundation, the social investor that explains this and gives an example of one called Future Elect um, in Southern Africa. So thanks, Maura. Um, and we just put out a list of 62, um, what we call political leadership incubators. So the world of, of, of catalysts may call them social entrepreneurs or SCOL. We sort of bring as a subsection of what social entrepreneurs are, as we call political entrepreneurs. And as a subsection of that, these people really work on 
on what we call political leadership incubation. Some of them are before the party, before they join parties, before they get into politics, really providing that, that bridge into some of the political systems. So what I'd like to do is introduce you to three of them um, on this list of 62, um, three people um, whose work I'm getting to know over the years, some from long distance and some for short, three I greatly respect. This is hard work. They're really pioneering um, a new and nascent field that has a lot of people momentum behind it, which I'm excited about. So I've asked um, each of them um, to answer two questions. So we're going to do it around. I'm going to ask them the first question, and then they'll answer answer it. And then I'm going to answer ask the second question. So um, our three political leadership entrepreneurs, um, as we heard, you know, solutions from the front lines. These are people on the front lines doing the work. Um, Kanshi um, Egral, the founder of Netri Foundation in India. Can you give us a wave? There you Hi. go. Good to be here. Really great to have you. Really great to have you. Um, Augusto Townsend, the CEO of Recambio in Peru. There they are. You can see them there. Um, welcome, um, Augusto. And then Sonia Yachtel, the founder of my favorite name, just personally, nothing against the other, Love Politics, is really embracing of what politics can be in our um, society. So the first question to you, Kangxi, is in a word or two, followed by a short explanation, um, how does your approach address what the audience wanted in the beginning around different um, governance and different political leadership? So over to you, and I'll give you a few minutes. Yes, thank you so much for having uh, me here. I'm Kangxi Agrawal, I'm from India. Uh, running Netri since 2019, Netri is India's first incubator aggregator for women in political ecosystem. Uh, so thank you so much for giving us the space and you've been a part of the Better uh, Democracy Support. Um, so I saw these uh, you know, SDGs and a lot of us are working at the intersection of all of it, right? Uh, the approach that Netri has taken that we are 50% of the population which is being women, like, and I'm including the trans and cis women, whoever identifies as women, uh, that spectrum is 50% or more, uh, but the abysmal representation, uh, the, the quality of representation, and all of those challenges of like how it's, politics is not even aspirational. It's like regarded dirty, it's regarded uh, uncertain, it's regarded untrustworthy, all those negative connotations with politics has kept the power away from such a large group of people and we have been underrepresented so much. Uh, this is the work that we are doing. So it comes at the intersection of uh, education, good governance, uh, institution building, gender equality, partnerships, um, peace and justice, because also like uh, nothing against uh, our male allies, but like we see the war and the crime in the world and then we look at like, you know, women are, you know, the damage uh, to it. Like, so that's how it happens. And women are never at the forefront of the wars and crime right now. Uh, so really love politics uh, is such a cool name because we really need to love policy, the politics to embrace it. The work at Nature Foundation has had alumni, about 700 alumni, six of them have contested at three different levels, the village level, the city level, uh, and the uh, assembly level in India, we have a very, very big country. Um, and all these uh, women participants, they come up with like challenges on how they do not have access to resources, how the parties are not giving enough quotas to these people. Uh, so I am really here, thrilled to see this room because we're talking about the intersection of governance but governance happens much later. Politicking happens first, right? Uh, the, the entry way into making long lasting impact is through politics and uh, women somehow have not gotten that opportunity. So our approach is that we work on three segments that we take uh, women uh, who want to be in politics or are currently in politics, take a training program with them, connect them to a tech platform where we also find teams uh, which is called Access Polity. It's a LinkedIn sort of a politics and policy opportunities in India. And then we also do research and advocacy work. Happy to chat about more. But uh, these are the intersections of educa political education, uh, leadership development, connecting them to the right opportunities, and ultimately seeing them through the process is what we are um, uh, you know, building in India. Super. As a follow-up, thank you very much. In a word, only a word, what gives you the most hope for the work you're doing right now, in a word. The power of community. 
power of community. Let's go from the community in India. Um, we heard her talk about women, the underrepresentation of women, almost in ev every country, there's work to do. It is the biggest gap in the World Economic Forum's uh, gender gap analysis. It is political leadership. There's been lots of gains in lots of places that political leadership still puts us. I think we're at like 170 years or 50 years or somewhere in there, depending on the year. I'm gonna go from India all the way over, picture ourselves on the globe going all the way over to Augusto, who's sitting in Peru. Um, and maybe Augusto, give it just to, maybe just to warm it up a little bit. I, I, my question to you is in a word followed by kind of a short explanation how does your work match what the audience is looking for? Maybe give like a, a little warm up of the political context for those who don't know what's going on in Peru and how this is important right now. Oh, unfortunately it's pretty bad. So uh, first of all, I wanna be, uh, I'm very thankful for being in this panel with uh, Kangxi and Sonia, very honored uh, by being given this opportunity. Recambio is a, a political leadership academy which basically uh, focuses on making democracy function again in a, a diverse uh, and pluralistic society because what we are experiencing in peru is that sort of like half the population uh, is uh, uh, thinking that the other half is sort of like an existential risk for them and vice versa so when we have elections if if the pol politician who I feel is more uh, close to me wins, I'm very happy. But if the other one wins, then I feel that the society is gonna crumble down, it's gonna uh, explode or something like that, no? And, 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 and this thing, which is integral, I think, to how democracies work, the idea of having a viewpoint diversity, of having a pluralism in your society, and basically accepting that people can think very different from you and they have the same dignity and the same rights, you know? That is no longer functioning like that in my country. So we recently came out from a coup d'etat because we had a president that half the country didn't want and they were doing anything they could do to oust him out from the presidency. And the president was actually trying to see a way in which he could remain in power undemocratically. So, so this very uh, aggressive, like warlike dynamic we have in our uh, 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 politics in Peru, uh, uh, I mean, our democracy, has never been like very well functioning, but the deterioration, the backsliding we've seen in the previous years has been very, very pronounced. And now it's very difficult to imagine how politicians can actually talk to each other, you know, find uh, common ground, uh, coincidences, consensus. It's very difficult. Uh, the, 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 the democratic pendulum is going from run one extreme to the other. And we need to sort of return some idea of moderation into our system, you know, so people can actually talk to each other and find uh, ways in which they can agree upon. And that's why we're trying to create sort of a new generation of political leaders with this idea, you know, so they can feel comfortable talking to uh, somebody on the other side. This is not easy. I mean, we do this. We know that this takes time. It's not something that happens overnight. It's very difficult to do at the scale, you no. Know? But we have to do it. We have to understand that it's going to take some time, but we need to start now because if we not, uh, uh, there's not going, to, not going to be anything to save uh, in a couple of years, maybe. Fantastic, Augusto. And in a word, what gives you hope about the work you're doing? I mean, it's so tense right now in Peru. It's so polarized in Peru. But in a word, what gives you hope? Um, I would say uh, leadership and empathy, maybe some uh, new way of, I mean, uh, it's probably the obvious answer, but w what I see is people uh, going into politics with a very different idea of how to think about politics, no? Uh, uh, and, and, and the problem with that is that they lose that at some point because the system is so corrupt that it's sort of, uh, I don't know how to explain it. it, it corrupts them at some point. So we need to uh, uh, protect them so that they can exert the, uh, this different uh, way of, of leading uh, 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 in their careers. No? I'm going to ask you one last follow-up question, Sonia, I'll go to you. One of the things we hear consistently is um, institutions shape people, as you just talked about, um, more than people can shape institutions which is one of the pushbacks people get about why do you care about politicians? If the system's so broken, why do you care about politicians? How do you, how do you push back on that? Um, from my perspective, uh, there's a lot of um, confidence in that institutional reforms will solve the problem. And I think it's a little bit misplaced because 
it's just one building block you need. So you, do to, you need to do institutional reform. You need to change the system dynamics. The rules are pretty bad. So you need to do that. But you need to also at the same time, and more importantly, I would say, you need to bring good, decent, competent people to politics. And that, that doesn't happen like magically. You, you need to find them, you need to uh, uh, entice them, you need to show that this is something they can actually do and be successful uh, in doing. And that's the most difficult part from my uh, perspective. Yeah, one thing we hear is like, what needs to go is this cult of the individual going to say, t change things. There needs to be a whole rush and pod, a team of people, a squad, whatever you call it, going in carefully um, with, with an agenda. Um, to build better politics. Sonia, we're going to move. Okay, we went from India on our plane over to Peru. Now we're going back over south of me in beautiful Vienna, consistently named one of the best cities in the world um, to live in. So something must be right about at least local politics, uh, which is pretty interesting. Um, I've studied the local politics and the interaction with the business and citizens and and government. You have just co-founded with Winfred, who's also um, on the line, something called Love Politics. In, in the European context, we say Dach, which just means Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. So I want to hear from you, and I know you've been in the media a lot. It's been quite interesting. The launching of your program has really gotten a lot of press attention in Austria. Maybe you can say why you think that's so. But the question I asked um, the other two was, in a word followed by a short explanation, how does your approach address what the audience wanted. So over to you, Sonia, and thanks for joining. Thank you, and welcome back in Europe. <laughs> um, um, it's really exciting, and um, it's really exciting to see how we all, all over the globe, miss out just a great deal of society's perspectives. So I think that's really, and that seems to be the only way how we can actually build bridges. So it's all about representation. It sounds so bold and, and so, so easy, but I think that that's just the solution. And well, coming from, uh, well, you know, we have really rich countries, Germany, Switzerland, and, and, and fantastic social systems. And still there's a great, great frustration in society when it comes to politics and politicians in general, and far right extremists are on the rise to a dramatic degree. We have uh, the latest um, elections, it was 25% actually. So that's that's really frightening. And um, us as Love Politics, as we said, it's just started. Uh, we had a, the, the new kids were grown-ups, <laughs> the new grown-ups on the block. And um, we had great, great attention to our projects. And there was quite some, um, uh, people were quite suspicious, not only, you know, people, parties, Parts and academics, uh, academies, so all of them would be really looking at us um, in a weird way. Um, and then we started asking groups of organizations of un uh, underrepresented uh, people. And, and that was really surprising to them, which was surprising to us again. You know, why, you know, why this is the first time that they are getting asked. And we're not only asking them for their opinions, we really wanted them and meant it to co create um, the program with us. And also, um, we just want them to be become the next decision makers. And this was really exciting for all of them. And it was also the great success of the program at the beginning, because they were calling out and they were asking others uh, to sort of join this program. They wouldn't have believed us, you know, white academics. Um, so they would they only believe their, their multipliers. And I think that was not just meaning it, but doing it. Well, so Nick, can I follow up on that? I know, I know for the programs that we sort of incubate and work closely with, um, Augusto and um, Love Politics, and of course with the PLA and Netri as well, um, it's really important to, um, when we say new and different, the, the, the focus on the different, the people that are underrepresented. Um, can you give the audience the statistic about the, 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 the mayor's male's names versus the number of female politicians in Austria? Um, we have more more mayors that are called Franz than they are female. So it's um, it's um, Francesco in Lima. I don't know what's in. But so it's um, it that's quite that's quite amazing. So it's seven percent of the Austrian mayors would be female. Yeah, and so more are named Franz than are female mayors. So um, Franz is a popular name. And is. I know very importantly um, in Europe and in other, in other contexts, um, engagement of migrants into mainstream political parties 
um, is, is really both an, a challenge and an opportunity. And we've had many in Europe in the last 20 years, 30 years, migrant waves who have not found their way into politics. And so I know that Love Politics is definitely working on that. They developed a design council. So these are programs by and for people in their community. Can you tell how many people applied your first time out? You had no idea how many people would apply. No one had ever heard of you. This isn't Coca-Cola. You have zero <laughs> marketing budget. How many people applied in the first program? Yeah, 1,245. Yeah. So there is hunger. There is hunger from people to understand how to get inside the system, right? And all three of these people work on fumes, basically. They work on fumes, right? It's the part of the social entrepreneurship. They do hard work every day that hasn't found a place in, in political philanthropy or in political work. Um, in a word, Sonia, what gives you hope about this work? Well, the trust really, you know, those, those, when this number, um, the trust really gives me hope. And, and also that there is so many of us all over the world. And thank you also for, you know, for doing this, Lisa, and connecting us because this is, now we can tell, being, being new to this, um, that's, that, that's really important. Yeah, well, that's that that. Other people will be out there and they're doing it too, and they are successful and it works. And so this is, this is really gives us hope. Fantastic. So I'm going to ask you quick, uh, quickly in a speed round, each of you, and if anyone has questions for them, please pop them up in the chat and I'll go ahead and relay them over. But what is your biggest insight, um, Kongshi, I'll start with you, on connecting good leadership to good governance? I asked Augusto a little bit about this, about this tension I find um, between um, uh, people are, you can't have, you know, why put good people into a broken system? You got to fix the systems first. Well, how do you fix the systems without good people? This is a tension. We, we were, um, Michael and Maura um, and I were just at the Skoll Foundation and this, this topic comes up of like this, this tension between the two. Um, how do you do it? What is your biggest insight on connecting that good leadership with that good governance? Right. Uh, so I heard like the squad word, right? And I always say that when we are putting good leaders, we cannot put them alone in a system. We have to put them with a community. You have to get a quorum. Uh, even if you look at the representation in the parliament in India, for example, if you do not, if you do have a quorum, you will not be whipped out by the party. For example, if I am a, you know, I'm a woman in the parliament and my party happens to be misogynistic. So I can't take a stance on something uh, unless and until I have built a quorum across party lines, otherwise I will be also whipped out, right? So idea is to build that quorum. What we have understood in our work, uh, good leadership to good governance happens through finding the right allies. Uh, the people, the first exercise that we always do, you have two kinds of constituency, the constituency that votes, but then there's the fleeting constituency concept that we always introduce. The fleeting constituency is that I may know a businessman not in my district, but is willing to do good work and is going to be ethical. So I pull them in. So the idea is to find your tribe, to find those people. And you do that as a first exercise when you're getting into politics. That is one thing. The second thing is that we've also seen that when uh, in India, the bureaucracy is very highly admirable, right? Politicians, you don't need to become a politician, but you should become a bureaucrat. Like that's something that we are taught from day one. Um, mm -hmm. And these bureaucrats have been handpicked by so many uh, politicians in the past to do good work and they are healed. A lot of people say this particular you know, uh, bureaucrat came in and he changed the system. So if a bureaucrat has that capacity, we just try to emulate it and say a politician has that capacity too. Uh, it's all a matter of if you give them the chance and the resources to support. Super, Augusto, I'm gonna, since you a bit answered the question, Daniel Stid has a question for you. It says, um, how do you make the case for investing and cultivating a rising generation of ethical, you're going to love this question, effective leaders when it will take years to bear fruit when the democratic institutions of one of the countries are faltering and threatened by attempted coups um, in here and now asking for a friend? And we get this a lot, particularly from like tech philanthropy, like what are your numbers and how quickly is it going to go when sometimes things can take a while? How do you answer this in your context? Great question, Daniel, thank you. Yes, thank you, Daniel, for the question. Uh, just a, 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 some thoughts on that. First, for us, it's very difficult to invest or get the financing to do what we do because uh, from the start, we cannot take money from a specific sector of society which would 
uh, make our uh, initiative perceived as if, as if it was sort of defending or promoting the interests of a specific se sector of society. So we need to be very careful for, uh, in terms of how we get money to do what we do. And that makes it much more difficult, no? But it's the only way. You need to do that, be very, very uh, careful about the caps you put in place and everything so that the legitimacy of the institution is preserved, no? Uh, then, also, uh, and, 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 and responding also to, to, to Lisa's point, uh, you, you you need a lot of bravery to do the not, not a bravery not not in ourselves that you know promote the the academy but in the candidates in the politicians them, themselves because if you have a country such as Peru in which all our living presidents are have very serious legal issues three of them are in jail next to each other three former presidents in jail one committed suicide because he didn't want to go to jail. So you can imagine that all of pol our political parties are very, very uh, corrupt. So if you want to go into politics, you need to go through one of them because that's the only way. You cannot do politics independently. No, you have to go through a political party. So the first generation of politicians that go uh, into this, uh, 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 go through our, uh, uh, you know, uh, our academy or experiences, they know they're going to share a parliamentary list, for example, with corrupt people. They know that. So this is very difficult for, for them because they know at, at any point somebody could associate them, relate them to corruption at some other space in their own political parties. So they are sort of sacrificing themselves, you know, to, to get the, the inroads to start building something that could become uh, bigger in time. But they're going to have to take a risk that the following generations are not going to have to take or, or they're going to improve the situation for those who come after them. So this first generation of people going into politics, they're like heroes. I believe that they're like heroes. They're sacrificing themselves to open a space to deal with the corruption that it inherently has so that the people who come afterwards uh, can do a better job. Thank you. I'm going to bridge to Sonia, who wants to answer Blair's question with just on the back of Augusto. One of the things we are doing, and we love your help with it, is this um, how hard it is to be in office now. 80% um, of women get death or rape or violent threats against them or their families um, in office. Really hard. Um, to say, go run for office. Johnny's been working on this on our and our team. Um, we are putting forward and working on the first ever global well-being of politicians survey, their mental well-being, because there's this belief, and this is funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, for those of you who follow that, because they think that it's hard to have healthy communities if you don't have healthy political leadership. So um, watch this space as we look at how do we support the well-being. And I, I just noticed many of you may know the well-being project, which I absolutely love. They're wonderful. But there was nothing called out for politicians, right? As because they don't see may, may, maybe not them, but maybe people in general don't see politicians as change makers. And I just challenge you all to put in the chat while I turn this over to Sonia about one politician you actually really do respect. I, th I think it was Chloe put something in about um uh, Jimmy Carter. There are great people in the system. Great people. I want to talk about that later. So over to you, Sonia, for some quick final words before we go to our breakouts. Mm, no, there was just one question uh, from Blair that I really uh, found very interesting because what we did when we designed our program, we had 60 interviews with politicians, like current politicians and also ones that used to be. And we asked them questions, what would you have needed to get in there easier, to start easier? What would you have needed to stay in politics? You know, all that kind of questions. And that really sort of, that, that was the base of our design. And um, and the one thing that was really, that was really vital, vital was that they started there with having a really strong compass, a really strong um, line of where they want to go and that was based on a very good experience on, on their former life before they went to politics. And, and also, you know, having a really good network and a really good uh, mentor for themselves that were the three very main, main things for them. And I think that's something that we could all, um, you know, uh, suggest for, for, for future politicians. Thanks, Sonia. We hope to do much more research and share it globally so people can understand that. Um, you guys did an excellent report. So now I'm going to Sorry, um, just come in and say one more thing. Just quickly, yes. 
So I just wanted to highlight that how uh, the question was around bearing fruit with good political leadership is like going to take a long time. And I think governance is a great, great metric. The moment you have anybody uh, working in the political system, you can put them in the policy space uh, as well and see that metric can be evaluated in six months or one year time and see who's performing really well in the social and government's governance change and then keep pushing their leadership forward. So I just like thought I, I should bring it here that how do we put metrics to evaluating what is a good uh, progression on leadership? Thank you very much. Um, and uh, Daniel, lots to talk about, about how we measure this and make the case for it. So thanks for bringing that up. I have some ideas. I'd love to come back to you. So now we're going to move to our jam board session where it's super interactive. We're going to have um, a bunch of breakout groups. You don't need to do anything, um, but just go there and be super interactive. Uh, we're going to interactively talk about indicators of good governance, um, indicators of good political leadership, and then we're going to spend some time on something called the three horizons patterning of hope. So sort of visioning and imagining um, what, what life could look like when we had this leadership that we all in our minds um, believe that we deserve. And now we're talking about how to get there. So um, you will, uh, if you just raise your hands like this, double in the air, someone is going to put you in a breakout group and then they swoosh, you into the next breakout group and someone will tell you what to do next and we'll come back in about uh, 15 minutes. Swoosh, swoosh. Uh, wow. with some really great people and um, I hope um, you all got to spend some time on slide three which is the sort of what does the vision look like we talked about ethics and moral code and institutions but I want to turn it over to someone that I haven't um, met before so first time I think it's our first time meeting but I've just heard fantastic um, uh, stuff about your work Rob maybe you could just quickly introduce yourself and give us a few minutes of your thoughts on this on on the future and where we're at with governance these days from a from a big picture perspective so this is on the spot so Rob thank you for agreeing yeah thanks Lisa um I'm having some internet instability problems so uh apologize if, if this doesn't come through clearly um uh, I work with the the Amidyar group which is a family foundations that um, met United Omidyar Network, uh, Omidyar Network India. There's 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 um, several organizations that are in the group, and I work with a team that doesn't work for any one of the foundations, but looks at. Uh, I, I work on systems and complexity as a across concern that applies across the group, and we, up two and a half years ago, we took up the question, what. Would, what would make for a health in a generation's time and in a fully digital age, what would make for a healthy system of governance that supports the well being of people as individuals and as a society? And we just asked that question to a lot of people from around the world in different occupations. And um, this is all, by the way, not a public, this will be a public thing at some point. It is not now. And we don't permission from our interviewees to make it public. Um, so, um, but the, the, What's really interesting to me in, in all this is, is the question that we started with about if you're investing in individuals with their in a broken system, you know, doesn't the system beat the individuals? And it, it really is a both end. I mean, it, the thing that came through very loudly in our, our interviews is we had to say to people, don't worry about how you get from here to there. Just tell us about 30 to 40 years, whatever you think that is, whatever gets you out of today, right? And, um, the when, when you get there when we began to get there then you really do see that what we're building toward actually is not a marginal change from where we are now there are a lot of things that need to be built now and corrected now and fixed now um and uh there are some fundamentally different sort of ways of looking at what the future is going to be and i mentioned this in the group but this idea that you have kind of an ecosystem of governance that 
Um, you're not you're not dependent. Elections are not the primary means by someone has uh, agency over everything that affects their lives, but it's an important part, right? So I think the the sort of the three horizons model, which we just began to get into, right? That third horizon is where we've been focused, and it feels like a lot of people in this call have been focused on like the first horizon, like how do we like get stuff moved now, and um, so that yeah, I think the pitch is around how how can we begin to think about those leaders and those types of programs that we could invest in that are starting to experiment with break ground, change the narrative about what the future of governance looks like and what it can be like. Um, some really powerful things came out of, out of the, the images that people shared with us, the ideas that people shared with us. I'll, I'll leave you the one just to end with, which is this idea that as much as, as much derision as platforms in the digital age have gotten, and rightly so, um, there's a lot of talk about these sort of pro-social, like government as more, or governance as more of a pro-social digital platform where th there is, it's polycentric, there's different, people can move around it. I, being a leader might be, I'm a leader on this one issue, on this one group that's global uh, versus I'm a leader in my local community, right? So anyway, that, um, I think that that imagination about what's possible, it, it took me probably six months of these interviews to sort of explode a lot of the, the, the assumptions I had about what was possible. But that's one thing I'll leave the group with, I think, is how do we, how do we sort of um, activate that imagination, change that narrative about what could, could be in, in some future time? Thanks, Rob, for that so much and for, for being on the fly and for the internet working. Um, I'm just back from Portugal where there's one of these political leadership incubators and I was with about 45 people under 30. They have less problem imagining um, what they want. And, and as a 50 year old, near 50 year old, I wonder about my, my muscles that I have to grow to imagine a different world and not get stuck in the status quo. So I'm gonna just do a quick one word chat um, and one word in the chat. Um, if you remember the three horizons model, and Rob was talking about this too, that business as usual needs to go down for the disruptive innovation to go up to get to that horizon. I love Rob, how you told people, don't worry about the messy middle. Like, let's just dream from where we're at now. Can anyone just put the first thing that comes to mind when you think of a disruptive innovation in politics right now? Like what's an example of something disruptive that you've heard of in politics? Um, that might help us move to that emerging future. So just pop it in if anything comes to mind. Ethical AI, citizens assemblies, two words is fine. Disruption of, yeah, thanks Johnny for putting that again. Anyone else? Collaboration, not competition. Yeah, participatory budgeting. We have a project right now where we're interviewing, Rob and others might be interested, interviewing politicians about what are the barriers and opportunities for uptake of what are the innovations around participatory governance writ large and democratic innovation. So it might be nice to sort of bring those worlds together. So as we wrap up, um, I have a background in brain and behavioral science, and I know that you will like this, most of you, much more if you can be creative, or at least you won't like it you may dislike me, but you will remember it more. So I want you to remember this experience about the possibilities, like that outward possibility about building better governance through better political leadership um, and better futures. So I'm gonna ask you all, I'm gonna be quiet for two minutes, really two minutes. And I want you to quickly, you can use chat GPT, whatever you want to write a haiku about what your takeaway or thought on this issue of better leaders, better governance. And as a reminder, um, haikus have, um, just reminder what they are, three, seven, three. Those are the syllables. And three lines. Sorry, five, sorry, I'm so wrong. Five, seven, five, I'm bad. Three lines, five, seven, five, often evoking nature, often invo invoking nature. So I'll be quiet for two minutes. Your haikus.
Okay, I'm going to start. Here they come in. Ava is leaving us hanging with her building peace circles. We, we've got the first line, Daniel, polit politics, leadership. They're not separate seasons, but integrated. He got the seasonal touch. Wow. Um, guiding with virtue, leading by true, moral compass strong. Chloe, here we go. It's the other part of Ava's. Um, encompass all participants and dreaming forward. So she's leaving us with that dream. Um, Kangxi, one step at a time, we get to our safe world with accountable political leaders. Um, reimagine, reimagine the future can be different. Young people forward. So you came back, Clara, to the young people piece. Um, Janani, leaders lead with heart, wise governance from the art, and it even rhymes, which isn't necessary uh, in haikus, unity in part. Anybody else want to jump in? One last one. I know this isn't everyone's, as they say, cup of tea. Oh, here we go. Entering with conviction, leading by example, and leaving a long-term legacy. Thank you. Why good governance? A seed is small and dismissed, but trees transform all. Reed is going for the nature thing. Excellent. Really good. Jason, love for SDGs, our earth. Good governance for all's worth. A little rhyming too. He's got you. Indigenous thrive life's mirth wow beautiful look at this all there goes molly all voices matter young people show us the way virtuous cycle thanks molly winfred world searching solutions which is more than a dream but dreams we need so calling for us to dream inclusivity doesn't have to cost much guide all be better thank you deepa beautiful yeah you all are beautiful poets so i want to leave you with five very oh michael big Dream big for big change, invest in ethical leaders, boost our goal 16. Back to the SDG, way you get extra bonus. So I wanna leave you with five really concrete things that you can do, maybe obvious, but it's worth calling out to build better politics. Number one, back to what Augusto was talking about, and it was really important in Daniel's in the breakout about pluralism. Um, reach out to people who have different political views and deeply listen. And there are programs to help you do this. I talk to people all the time who don't even know people with different political views. So great program out of the um, uh, BBC on having different conversations all around the world. If you want any more information, be in touch with us. Really consider running for office and not alone in a group. Um, there are lots of great political leadership incubators, different ways to engage political parties. We spend a lot of time learning from what we call the gardeners in political parties to new and different reform-minded people. Um, stop confusing good government with bad government, good politicians with bad politicians. They, you may disagree with them, um, but saying that all politicians are corrupt isn't helping us with the narrative of making that um, change to the innovations we need. Um, I, I'm looking more at the work of uh, workplace civic education. Um, Danielle Allen talks about the importance of your mental well-being and your well-being in general about being civically engaged. So in, in our breakout, we talked about what's good for engaged citizens. So we can't talk about politics without engaged citizens and consider building a political leadership incubator and in your organization to bridge the work to better governance. We'd love to talk to you about that. So the last word um, in these programs, you can take down that screen, is always yours. So I'd love, um, in these last three minutes, your one word takeaway. It could be a sentence, a word followed by a sentence, but what did you all take away or what has this left you wanting? We know that an hour and 15 minutes is not gonna fulfill everything, but it could have left you with an insight or a thing you want more of. So I'll give you a minute, take a look. Really kudos for the great haikus. Feeling solidarity with people, tolling the similar vineyards and other places. I feel like that's another haiku in you. Um, bridging now to the future. Rob, I'm obsessed with that. Thank you. There is appetite for this work and we need to resource it and not in drips and drops. How do we create ripples, right? Really important. Um, collaboration, inspiration. Thanks, Molly. You are not alone. No, you're not, Winfred. Growing momentum, shared sense of purpose. Other folks. Um, Youth activation, we rock politics, more women. There's no time like the present. 
youth activation, willingness to do the right thing, important for values. Um, Chloe um, studies ethics. This is her job. Um, there aren't many, so now you know one. You can call them one. I plan on calling you to really help define and what are those different ethical frameworks? How can you have different ethics but not want to kill each other? Can you? Really interesting philosophical question. Willingness to do the right thing. So thank you everyone for caring. I think Blair who had to jump off said that this good governance piece, which we have institutions, we have citizens, we have leaders, it's the underpinning, right? Both Mora and Michael said this to all of our work. And I just wanna give Mora and Michael, do you wanna jump in for any last comments before we hit our time? Mora, you first. Um, no, I'll just say this was incredibly enlightening and I just give, um, I show so much respect for the folks on the front lines and thank you so much for your contributions. It gives me hope. Michael. No, only that we need more of this conversation. I would love to dig into like, how do you set up a political incubator? What works or doesn't it? It's, it's sparking more ideas and demands. So I hope this is just the start. Super. Thank you, Molly, very much. One of the things we keep hearing around the world is a desire from folks um, in this space, particularly from philanthropy, government, to understand what does political philanthropy look like? How do we spark um, more money into this space around leadership that's effective and ethical? So I'd like to be in touch with you. I had a really exciting dinner in Amsterdam where they're looking at in the, um, in the Netherlands a permanent fund for the stimulation of better politics, which is taxpayer funded money that might be able to match philanthropic money. And how do we learn from those models in different places? So with that, if everyone could go off mute and we're gonna wave and say goodbye in our language. Thanks to all of you who are speaking in a second language as the arrogant American who speaks the first language. I'm so grateful. So goodbye from Berlin, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.